viruses are far more diverse and far more interesting than those that cause human disease like COVID-19. So I do want to talk a little bit about where they might sit in the tree of life, and that is a discipline known as cladistic. A lot of our futuristic technology around um, genetic changes to the crops we eat, the clothes we wear, um, will all rely very heavily on a technology known as CRISPR. But I want to show you that without viruses, we actually would not have, I guess, discovered CRISPR. And I want to tell you what that's all about as well, and that genetic modification isn't quite as dramatic as it sounds. And then finally, at the later part of today's seminar, we will then talk about COVID-19 in from perhaps a more biological perspective, but more importantly, some of the biology and science behind the development of a vaccine. And some of you know that this is a global race. Uh, it is a race that it's not, you know, there, there is no competition while I say it is a race because the outcome is for the benefit of all. And that is to develop a vaccine for COVID-19, which the University of Queensland that I'm privileged to work at um, is spearheading. And perhaps before we talk about, you know, the biology of viruses, we might want to clarify exactly what is a virus. And perhaps one of the things that we might want to do in our contemplation of what a virus is, is to see where it sits in the phylogenetic tree of life. We understand from the discipline of phylogenetics that we are able to organize all living organisms in a meaningful way. This is a study called cladistics, and we're organizing organisms into various groups that are biologically meaningful. Traditionally, of course, before the advent of phylogenetics or our understanding of genetics and DNA, we organize organisms based on their shape and form. So the physical characteristics that we see. But today, because we understand how genetics work, we're able to then put those that are more genetically similar to each other into more less, sorry, I should say, into less distantly related groups. And what that means is that these organisms that you see tell us something about how they relate to each other in evolutionary time. So if we look at the tree of life, which is a diagrammatic expression of all forms of life, we have on one end the small and the mysterious, and they are bacteria. The image that you see before you is a bacterium that you are very familiar with. This is Escherichia coli, or E. coli for short. And many of us are familiar with E. coli because a lot of our understanding of genetics has come from this one bacterium, but it is also the bacterium that causes food poisoning. Um, and if you ever have a bad bout and you've gone to the bathroom, uh, well, that's probably because of E. coli. And so you can see here, don't get too obsessed with the detail, but those of you who are interested will know that these really are the broad groups of bacteria and we've organized them in a specific way. Now, what we call the sister group, so the next most closely related supergroup of organisms are called the Archaeans. Um, and they form this huge kingdom called the Kingdom Archaea. And if you look at this image here, unfortunately, I can't see the chat group on my uh, screen. But um, if any of you can tell me what this is, where we are, that this image actually shows you, feel free to type it into the chat group. Now, I can't actually see the chat group on my screen, but that might be a good thing because I'll give you a few seconds to type your responses in and then I'll reveal the answer and then you can see whether you got it right. Um, so, can you guess where we are? Ah, okay. This is a hydrothermal vent and you find it in the depths of the ocean in environments that are often incredibly extreme. And what I mean by that is that they either have, you know, incredibly, um, or, or I guess temperatures outside of the usual range that you find organisms, so very, very high temperatures, and in other parts of the globe, very, very cold temperatures, and in some environments high in chemicals that are typically toxic to life, yet life persists. 
we call these types of, of organisms extremophiles, which is a very, very Greek way of saying they love the extreme. And so archaeans are organisms oftentimes microscopic that have thrived in extreme environments. And a lot of, I guess, um, discovery is still yet to occur in this kingdom of life. And, you know, we could dedicate an entire lecture outside of today talking about these really, really cool organisms and some of, of the interesting properties they have and how we have used them to improve our own lives. But that's a story for another time. Right down, of course, to um, the group that you are more familiar with. We, as animals, are eukaryotes. And you'd be surprised to find that fungi, um, mushrooms perhaps, that you're more familiar with, are actually more closely related to us as animals than to plants that they look like. But there are also lots of other organisms that are eukaryotic, and we are special, um, and we'll reveal some of that later on. Um, the animals that you are very familiar with, um, including your mammals and birds, are all eukaryotes or all examples of eukaryotes. And these three here are my pets. They are my lovely dogs. I have three of them. Um, and you can see that they also attend university at UQ. Um, so these are largely the groups of organisms that we know of, okay? Uh, you will note that viruses are nowhere on this phylogenetic tree of life. And that's because I want to ask you where you might find them. Talking about dogs, though, in the same way that we have organized all of these major living organisms, we too can organize breeds of animals. This um, phylogenetic tree here looks very artistic, and it is, and it's so well color-coded, but I just wanted to show you that we can, um, I guess, organize breeds as well. And the reason why I wanted to show you this is because all breeds, and largely this is by virtue of domestication. Um, so any organism that we domesticate, not just animals that are charismatic, but plants, a lot of the crops that we eat, are all essentially one species. So they're one species, yet they appear uh, in such a variety of shapes and forms. So they are the same species, but they are different varieties, or they're different breeds, or they're different subspecies. And in the same way that you saw the phylogenetic tree, in the last slide, we too can organize them in this way. Um, and so all modern day dogs are derivatives of wolf ancestors, and we can organize them in this way. So phylogenetic trees really allow us to infer evolutionary relationships. And being able to understand how different organisms are related to each other is incredibly important along with our understanding of the diseases that affect organisms, if we understand how, how we have evolved differently, and a good example will be, say, because it's topical now, in the quest for a vaccine, there obviously, there is, by the way, very limited evidence of, of this, um, but you would have heard the news um, uh, showcasing that the coronavirus um, may have, I guess, originated from bats. So if we're able to trace our lineage with bats, we can probably investigate, investigate how closely related we are with them to know what other organisms might be vulnerable, but we can probably also find clues into how these viruses are behaving. So I have a question for you. You've just learned about the main domains of life, where do you think viruses will sit? Do you think they're more closely related to bacteria or archaea or to eukaryotes like us? Where do you think viruses sit? I'll give you a few seconds to think about this before I reveal the answer. So in the tree of life, where do you think viruses sit? And the answer is they don't sit on the tree of life. And that's because viruses are non-living. Some of you got that, fantastic. Um, and I think I need to bring it all back to why it is that they haven't been classified as non-living. 
yet they have the ability to infect living cells. Uh, many of you are familiar from your high school days in general science class, the basic, I guess, structure and organization of the eukaryotic cell, which largely distinguishes us from all other life forms. And that is that within our cells, we have organized structures that perform very, very specific functions. Now, we are not going to go into the, the, to the detail of all of these structures, which we call organelles, but you are familiar with one superstructure known as the nucleus. And within the nucleus, you will see that the most important thing that codes for every aspect of your biology, and that is DNA, is organized very, very neatly into condensed structures called chromosomes. So you're familiar with this. And if we start to unwind these highly condensed structures, you will see that we are able to identify very specific genetic sequences that make up our DNA. So a good 15, 20 years ago, as a race, we embarked on the most ambitious biological project. And that was the Human Genome Project. And based on our understanding of DNA, map out the entire genetic sequence of humans as a species. And we successfully achieved this all those years ago. And we know that the human genome is about 3 billion base pairs in length. So a while ago, when we saw that image over here, each of these tiny little links is a base pair. Those of you doing biology, you know exactly what this means, but those of you attending that don't know about biology, don't worry. Just know that these are very, very unique in terms of the sequence and the order in which these base pairs occur. And it's that unique sequence of base pairs that code for, for various things. And we'll learn a little bit more about genetic sequences shortly, and certainly in the quest for a COVID-19 vaccine, why it's really important to understand the, the genes um, or the sequences at play. So the human genome, if I can represent this in this graph, uh, that's, you know, this horizontal line that you see here represents 3 billion base pairs. Now, if we were to scale that relative to the genomes, and the genome meaning the entire genetic sequence of other organisms like bacteria, E. coli, for example, is only about 5 million base pairs. These are obviously much smaller organisms, so they don't necessarily carry with them a lot of genetic material. So remember, a human cell, those 3 billion base pairs is packed into each and every one of your cells, apart from your red blood cell, but the biologists would get that. Um, bacteria, being microscopic and incredibly small, only have about 5 million base pairs. What about viruses? So, remember a while ago we suggested that viruses might be non-living. They do, however, have some characteristics that might appear living, including carrying genetic material. But how they use that genetic material is remarkably different to other organisms, but they do have genetic material. And if we put that into perspective along with these, the other two bars, viruses are incredibly small. And your typical virus is only about 2,000 base pairs. They are tiny packets of protein. They are literally just little fragments of DNA in our environment. And we have thousands, if not millions, of viruses that we're exposed to on a regular basis. So you now have some perspective on the size of these organisms. When we are dealing with coronavirus that causes the COVID-19 disease, now the official name for that virus is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, unlike most viruses, SARS-CoV-2 is about 30,000 base pairs, so larger than your typical virus, which has, in fact, been a challenge, okay? But we can talk about those things a little later on. So you must be wondering why it is that we don't classify viruses as living things, and that's largely got to do with the inability to perform, uh, you know, I guess, 
processes that are associated with living things. And there are certain criteria for being alive that you and I can do that viruses cannot. Um, you can all metabolize your food. We all need energy to work and function, and we get that energy from what we consume. But we can't obviously break this down without our body's ability to metabolize it into energy in a usable form. Viruses cannot do that. We all have the capacity for reproduction, and you and I know exactly how we achieve that. Bacteria do that in different ways, and shortly, I will show you that viruses don't reproduce. They replicate, and how they replicate is incredibly fascinating. We respond to stimuli, you know. If you fail an exam, that is a stimulus, and you respond to it in a certain way, hopefully not in a negative way but we respond to stimulus in our environment. Viruses don't quite do that. Uh, we also have the capacity for complex growth. You look, so, you look similar, but not identical to your parents, and you look completely different to your best friends. So this is a result of very, very complex growth, and that's something that viruses cannot do. And that largely distinguishes us from viruses, or I should say distinguishes viruses from all other living organisms. Now let's talk a little bit about the capacity for viruses to reproduce. But reproduce, like I said, is not a great word. Replicate is more appropriate because viruses don't reproduce, they replicate. In order to replicate, it means that you must find some mechanism to copy and paste your genetic material. And it literally is that copy, paste, copy, paste which we'll talk about shortly. However, in order to replicate, one of the first steps that must occur is the ability for recognition. What you are seeing here, this is a video and hopefully it's playing smoothly for you. You will see here a virus cell. And on the outside of the virus cell, these blue structures that are always proteinaceous, meaning that they're composed of proteins. They are protein-based. And these proteins have very, very specific structures that bind to receptors on the cell. Say, for example, this might be a human cell. And then the cell responds to the virus and in most cases, receives the virus. Okay, so this really is how a virus infects a host. It is largely got to do with recognition. The reason why we are falling ill from SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, is because of structures on the outside of the coronavirus for which the human body has receptors to, which it also explains why in some other organisms, if you expose them to coronavirus, they don't suffer the effects of coronavirus because their systems lack the receptors to receive the virus. So we're talking about these external structures now, and viruses are in fact quite beautiful. So I mentioned that on the outside of the virus, that really is the key. It is usually composed of proteins, and it is the ability of the host cell to recognize those protein structures that then cause successful infection. Tobacco mosaic virus is a very, very typical virus that we associate it with the crops that we eat. Any of you studying agricultural science at the moment would be very familiar with this virus because it is a virus that dominates the agricultural landscape. Adenovirus, which is also the virus that causes flu-like symptoms. Look at this. This is quite a spectacular geometric I guess, structure, isn't it? And obviously, these are computer-generated images. And on the right-hand side is some uh, imaging, OK? So obviously, you need very high-powered microscopes, like scanning electron microscopes, in order to obtain images of this quality. Influenza, which causes your typical flu, um, well, it also looks quite pretty, doesn't it? OK, so this here is a scanning electron micrograph of your typical influenza virus. It looks um, like a big ball of fluff. Uh, it's incredibly tiny, but you notice in the computer-generated image here, the key to that protein 
envelope, which is on the outside. And that really is to protect the genetic material that's housed within. So really, vir virologists, the biologists who study viruses, perhaps the best way in which they would define a virus is essentially a genetic material floating around, but enveloped in protein. This here is perhaps a very bizarre looking virus. And we call this a bacteriophage, or some will say bacteriophage, okay? So the bacteriophage is, like all viruses, possesses genetic material. You can see in this image represented by the curly-whirly line over there. And it is actually protected by, again, protein. They look so out of this world, but I promise you this really is the best way to describe them because look at exactly how they look like under a scanning electron microscope, which is over there. Um, so what do bacteriophages do? And this is leading nicely into the next segment of our seminar, which we go into modern day genetic manipulation technology. A lot of what we understand of how we can manipulate genes today, we are actually very, very thankful to bacteriophages for. Bacteriophages are viruses, but unlike the viruses that you're familiar with, tobacco mosaic virus affects plants. Adenovirus, influenza virus affects animals. Bacteriophages are the viruses of bacteria. So even our microscopic pals, bacteria, also have viruses. How complex and beautiful is nature? So bacteria too have viruses, and obviously, we are so different from bacteria, we have nothing to worry about, okay? You could have a million bacteriophages on your skin cell now, and I promise you nothing will happen to you. Bacteriophages infect bacterial cells, and they use those hook-like structures to secure themselves onto the host and then puncture the bacterium cell membrane. And then they insert the genetic material into the bacterial cell. And if they do this successfully, they replicate. They hijack the bacteria's uh, uh, immune system and eventually the bacterial cell will die. This is called lysis, that's the technical term. And many, many baby bacteria, I shouldn't say baby, but many, many bacteriophages will now appear. It literally is a cloning process. So that's why we don't refer to um, uh, bacteria being able to reproduce, but rather being able to replicate. Now, I have a challenge for you. I want us to actually de de delve a little bit deeper into bacteriophages and bacteria, because they've been around a far longer time than the human race. And I'm going to take you now back, not to the Second World War, not to the First World War, but to the war preceding that, World War Zero. And World War Zero is the war between bacteriophages and bacteria. So these are the two sides fighting for survival. I'm going to give you a minute now while I have a sip of water to do some critical thinking. And I like to do that in my classes. I like to give my students a bit of a breather to think, but I want you to think critically you would put yourself in the shoes of a bacteriophage and then put yourself in the shoes of the bacterium. I want you to critically think about what it means to win this war. So if you are a bacteriophage, how do you win your war? If you are a bacteria, how do you win your war? Your one minute starts now. Those of you who would like to share your responses with us, please feel free to do that in the chat group, although I cannot see. Um, and those of you who are a bit shy, that is perfectly fine. What is important is that you are thinking. In about 30 seconds, I'm going to reveal the answers. 
wonderful. Thank you all very much for your responses. And while I can't see them, I'm sure they've all been uh, very insightful. Um, so how do you win? Well, if you're a bacteriophage, you are the virus, your goal is to successfully create more bacteriophages. So as a bacteriophage, you win when you're able to very successfully infect the bacteria. In other words, you have bypassed all of the bacteria's security systems, if you like. In other words, you can successfully breach the cell membrane, you go undetected, and you enter the bacterial cell and interfere with its own replication processes. Now, if you are a bacteria, how do you win? Well, if you have invaders invading you, you need to invest energy in getting rid of them. The way in which you do that is perhaps by creating me mechanisms to detect bacteriophages. And if you can detect that there is a virus in you, you can then deal with it. You can either eliminate it or you can deactivate it. So a bacteria wins when a bacteria is able to successfully develop mechanisms to detect the virus. Remember that the virus is injecting a genetic sequence. So what the bacteria has, what the bacteria needs to do is a mechanism to detect that genetic sequence. Hopefully you can start to see the brainchild of genetic modification because the first step in genetic modification is being able to detect the genes that you don't want. And so our understanding of technology, which is called CRISPR-Cas9, I'm about to introduce that to you, is actually developed from our understanding of bacteriophages and how bacteria responds to those bacteriophages. I hope you're enjoying that. So if we look at a bacterial genome, which can be represented by this bar over here, the virus needs to find a way to integrate itself with the bacterial genome. And if it does this successfully, then it has hijacked the bacteria's replication capacity. And so the bacteria now, instead of producing more bacterial cells, will produce more viral products because the virus genome has been integrated with its own genome. So what's the policeman? We need to find a mechanism to detect that this region of the bacterial genome is foreign that this region is viral and that this region is unwanted. And we have this guy here to thank. This is a protein, actually it is a complex of proteins that collectively we call Cas9. There's a little bit of reverse engineering here because we actually only found out or discovered about this protein after we discovered CRISPR technology, which I'm going to introduce to you in the next slide. So we call it CRISPR-associated protein 9 because there are many other CRISPR-associated proteins, but this is the one that is most promising. Cas9, we're going to call it. Cas9 is represented by that very complex blue structure. What you will notice is that Cas9 is holding on to a light blue strand of genetic material. This can be DNA, this can also be RNA for those of you who are familiar, but let, let's not worry about that. This is genetic mm -hmm. material. So what Cas9 is holding on to is in fact the genetic material of interest. And in the case of bacteria, it is holding the genetic material of the virus from the bacteriophage. So what it does now is it moves along the bacterial genome represented by the purple and pink strands. And when it comes to a point where the light blue strand that it's holding matches the purple or the pink strand of the bacteria's genome, it goes, aha, I've located the virus. Now I'll do something about it. I can either eliminate it or deactivate it. This really is on a molecular level, an immune system of the bacteria working. So CRISPR-Cas9 technology relies very heavily on our understanding of that phenomenon. 
CRISPR, it sounds very cool, but it actually is short for clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeat. Now, let's not worry too much about the technicality, but let's go into the detail a little bit closer. So a while ago, I showed you this image. So Cas9 is that blue complex structure made of proteins. CRISPR refers to these short genetic sequences that we will now use in order to detect sequences of interest. The purple structure represents the genome of interest. So let's talk a little bit about how we might use this technology. Imagine this purple pink strand is your genome. And let's say you have a predisposition to Alzheimer's disease, which is a genetic disease. And let's say we know the specific genetic sequence that codes for Alzheimer's disease. We can inject your cell with CRISPR-Cas9 and CRISPR-Cas9 will detect the specific sequences in your cell that are responsible for Alzheimer's disease and then do something with it. This is research that we are currently doing at UQ, but also in other universities around the world. And that is using our understanding of genetic technology to improve the lives of others. So let me take you a little deeper into the cell. That, that big purple blob is the nucleus. And if we enter the nucleus, that is where a lot of the replication occurs. So we are going to go and zoom in to the nucleus now. And you remember that within the nucleus, your genetic material packaged neatly into the chromosomes. And if we unwind the genetic material, we start to see the specific genetic sequences that we are composed of. CRISPR-Cas9 works this way. This is the Cas9 protein, and you can see that it is holding on to some genetic material of interest. Let's say for this example, this could be the genetic sequence of Alzheimer's disease, okay? So Cas9 is this blue blob holding on to a guide RNA that we know is responsible for Alzheimer's disease. We've now introduced CRISPR-Cas9 into your body. Let's say you have a family history of this disease, and there's a high chance you're going to get it. So if we design a therapeutic involving CRISPR-Cas9, it will start to read your genetic material, your genome. And when it finds a match to the guide RNA that it is holding, this is what it will do. It will unwind your genetic sequence, make sure that every single base pair matches, then it knows, aha, yes, this is the fragment or this is the segment of your genetic sequence that is going to predispose you to Alzheimer's disease. And then it will activate other proteins on the Cas9 complex that you can see now highlighted in pink, and we cut your genetic sequence. In essence, after we have cut your DNA, your body is going to repair it. It's going to try and repair that cut, but our bodies aren't that great. Most of the time, it does it wrongly. And when it repairs it wrongly, it deactivates the gene. And so we can use CRISPR-Cas9 to deactivate the gene that cause disease. This is one application of CRISPR-Cas9, thanks to our understanding of viruses. What else can we do? We can tag onto CRISPR-Cas9 enzymes. So very shortly, you will see that instead of using the cleaving protein, we use this orange enzyme that we are able to attach to Cas9. What will this enzyme do for us? Well, let's see. We're going to introduce this new complex to the genetic sequence again. And once it's located our sequence of interest, the enzyme will change specific base pairs into base pairs that we want. So if we know a sequence that we don't want, we can change 
every single base pair into sequences that we want. And this is genetic manipulation. For example, if you want specific traits in the crops that you eat, if you want, say, a piece of corn to double in size, we could perhaps create one based on this technology. Now, I know exactly what you're thinking. You're going to go, oh my God, does this mean that I can design my baby? In theory, you can, but that's far more complex because what I've showed you in this video is provided and assuming that you know the specific sequences that will definitively result in specific traits. And we're far from designing our babies, but we are close to a lot of other ingenious innovations that can rely on CRISPR-Cas9, creating foods of the future, creating fuel of the future using algae and creating alternative sources to fossil fuel. Gene therapy, where we are able to then substitute disease-causing genes and deactivating it or substituting them for healthy genes. We can use this technology for the development of drugs that might be, um, I guess, delivered through biological mechanisms and lots of other, other exciting applications. And this really is the work of future careers in genetics, including people who want to become geneticists, biotechnologists who then transform those ideas into viable products and services, and modern agricultural scientists. And I know that places like Bangalore, for example, are really focused on biotechnology, and there are other provinces that agricultural science is more popular. Know that there is a lot of synergy amongst scientists. Who is to say an egg scientist cannot work with a geneticist to then work with a bio biotechnologist to create a viable product and services? And of course, you can take a step in the reverse direction and go into the more quantitative aspect of things. How do we synthesize all of the data into a meaningful story? That is the work of quantitative biologists, which is also another exciting field in biology. Now let's talk about what you really, really are currently interested in, and that is the quest for a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. So I'm going to very, very briefly, for those of you that don't really know how SARS-CoV-2 infects the human body, this is going to be a crash course for you. And for those that thought they knew, you might be surprised to find out what actually happens in the human body. Of course, COVID-19 is the name of the disease, but the disease is caused by SARS-CoV-2, which as many of you know, is a coronavirus because of the structures on the envelope. And those structures, do you remember what they're made of? They are made of protein, and that is key because those proteins have very, very specific molecular structures that the vaccine is going to be based around. Obviously, the disease itself, you know, causes cough-like symptoms, breathing difficulties, so on and so forth. So let's talk about what happens when you contract the virus. Then we also want to talk about what really happens inside your body that causes you to fall ill. And finally, let's talk about how we can understand viruses a bit more and how a vaccine might actually work. So remember a while ago, we discussed that all viruses are packets of protein housing genetic material within. The coronavirus has about 30,000 base pairs. It's larger than most viruses, but it is still packaged in an envelope of protein. If you look at this image, you will see that the proteins are colored, light blue and red. And largely that's what we're working with for coronavirus. Um, obviously that's not the actual color. We don't even know if they actually have color or have pigment. This is because they're so tiny and we're able to computer animate them. Now, what's important are these protein spikes. 
So coronavirus, as the name suggests, those protein structures look like uh, a crown or little spikes on the surface. And it really, it, it's those spikes that have the receptor, that actually work with the receptors in our body. It's those spikes. So they are actually the important bit here that form that recognition site in our body. So imagine if there was a patient infected with SARS-CoV-2 and sneezes, and then transmits the virus through the sneeze into a second patient. This is why it's so important to maintain social distancing. But if unfortunately a virus enters a second person through their airway, the virus will then start to interact with our throat cells. So now we're in the throat of, a, of the second victim. And our throat cells have those receptors on the surface of the throat cell. And yes, as many of you have guessed, it is the receptors that can specifically recognize and then bind to those protein spikes on the coronavirus. And the response is to envelop the virus. So it absorbs the virus into the cell. And at this stage, the virus has hijacked our cells. Unlike other viruses, it is not going to use our nucleus to replicate. It actually bypasses that process altogether. That virus, coronavirus, releases its genetic material and it actually utilizes other proteins inside our cells. So it doesn't use our nucleus. It uses our ribosome. Ribosomes are what synthesizes the proteins in our body. So ribosomes are inside your cells and their function is to create proteins as the building blocks for the rest of our body. Coronavirus will hijack ribosomes and get ribosomes to create those spikes and send all of those spikes up to the surface of our cells during which we will now so imagine all of these spikes going up, okay? And then on the outside, this is what it will look like, okay? So all of these protein structures that the ribosomes have developed have gone to the surface of our cell. And then eventually what happens? It goes on the outside and then it replicates into a new coronavirus. So the way in which SARS-CoV-2 replicates slightly different to other viruses. How can we actually develop pneumonia-like symptoms? So what actually happens in your body? Most of you doing biology would be familiar with this phenomenon. So obviously, when we breathe in, we breathe through the large airway from our throat down into our lungs. So we have the trachea, which is the main airway that then branch out into smaller airways. So you have larger structures called bronchii that eventually go to very small refined structures called bronchioles. And it is in the bronchioles that you find tiny microscopic structures called alveoli, okay, that actually allow for the exchange of gases. So if you have a look at alveoli, which are these tiny little sacs of air, it's surrounded by tiny blood vessels, our capillaries. And the capillaries are these tiny, tiny blood vessels. You can see the blue is the carbon dioxide going out and the red is the oxygen coming in. Carbon dioxide going out and red oxygen coming in. And that's exactly what's happening right now as you breathe deeply in and out. Oxygen goes into our bloodstream, and at the same time, the deoxygenated blood comes back, releasing carbon dioxide. When coronavirus infects our past airways, it will find its way down here, and it's small enough to enter our capillaries. And so, what happens in a typical healthy person is 
like the bacteria we talked about a while ago, we too, our bodies too, have mechanisms to detect foreigners. And we have our immune system that relies heavily on white blood cells, as you are familiar. White blood cells will detect these viruses, and in a healthy patient, the white blood cell will reach out and bring in, see, this is a white blood cell. It will reach out and draw in the virus particles and destroy them, okay? It draws in the virus particles and destroy them. The issue arises when there are too many virus particles and our body are overwhelmed, or if we have a compromised immune system and lack either the quantity or the quality of white blood cells that perform this function. We also generate as a response a lot of mucus, a lot of waste, because if you destroy the virus, if the white blood cell destroys the virus, you've got to get rid of it in some way, right? So you create a lot of mucus, a lot of liquid waste. And in most healthy people, our bodies have very natural way of expelling that waste. You can clear your throat, you can um, sneeze, you can cough it out and expel the phlegm. So our bodies have very natural ways of relieving that. But in some people where they, have, where they are immunocompromised or if they have dif difficulty doing that or if their bodies just hyperreact and create too much of that mucus, then they will start getting all these ailments associated with COVID-19 as a disease. So really, it's not the virus directly causing harm to our body, but rather the body's response to the virus that have a trickle-down effect and then all these issues that are associated with disease. And in very extreme cases, the requirement of ventilators to help us breathe. So that's actually what happens. And so how do we actually develop a vaccine? There are many, many organizations working towards the collective good of a vaccine. And this must be the way, even though it's competitive and even though it's a race to the finish, it is this diversity of different people using different techniques to best maximize our chances of an effective vaccine. Everybody's doing something a little bit different, but the key concept is pretty much the same. And I believe some of you have lots and lots of questions, and some of you have already guessed an effective mechanism. So we will inject a vaccine inside a patient, and a COVID-19 vaccine could likely work effectively in the same way that current flu vaccines work. And that is we inject something in the body that will then interact with those binding sites. And what we inject in the body, we call antibodies. Now, what this antibody might actually be is what different people are working on. Because you can work on very, very different antibodies. And some of you have heard of blood plasma. Others have heard of attenuated virus. Some have worked, and the UQ technology I'm about to show you works on something completely different, but the principle is the same. We will bind to those receptors. Again, the white blood cells can do their job, but it also means that the receptors in our body that would typically bind to those protein spikes can no longer do so because they can't recognize it anymore. So it literally is like if you expose these viruses that have been modified, they would literally appear as if they were bouncing off your cell because the cell cannot recognize it. And if they cannot recognize it, they cannot envelop it. So what the actual antibody is, that's what different organizations are working on. Okay, so again, it's this antibody matched with the protein spikes on the outside of the virus that is probably the answer to the vaccine of tomorrow. And once it's in our bodies, essentially they're deactivated. I'm really, really excited to share this with you. And that is the fact that the University of Queensland that I have the privilege of teaching at is a world leader in this space. And here you can see here um, some of our heroes. We all have heroes of our own. 
but these are our heroes at UQ. These are the scientists working on that vaccine. We've received quite a lot of external funding to do this, and we are the only Australian organization officially tasked by the Coalition of Epidemic Preparedness Innovation to actually develop a vaccine. And the reason why UQ was enlisted to do this is largely because of our expertise in the area. We have technology that fast tracks vaccine production. And while COVID-19 is still under work, we have successfully created vaccines for lots of other viruses, including those that you can see here. And this red structure that you see here, which we call clamps, these are the clamps that are the equivalent of antibodies that will bind to those protein structures and in doing so, deactivate the viruses. We have a candidate. Uh, we basically have a clamp ready to go and we're about to start preclinical trials. Some of you have heard about other universities, for example, Oxford in the UK working on uh, a different, uh, uh, I guess, delivery of a vaccine, which might include something like using blood plasma. There are lots and lots of ways that we can work on this. Um, I'm not going to say too much more. Don't forget that science is also locked up behind commercialization and intellectual property. But I want to showcase, I guess, what I am allowed to, and that is that a lot of the technology that we have um, has already been used for vaccines against other viruses and lots of promising prospects for COVID-19. And we, fingers crossed, within the next four to five months or so, should probably able, be able to scale this up and implement it. Thank you all so very much.